I'm super excited to be here with Alan Schwartz. Uh, Alan is, your former life, you were a data-driven journalist for the New York Times. You were nominated for Pulitzer Prize, which is pretty epic. Uh, do you want me to tell me a little uh, bit more please, about this? Praise me. Yes, use no, use adjectives. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I mean, the reason I'm here, of course, on behalf of the Data Literacy Project is to share my experience using data in journalism and trying to, however, backdoor, uh, let, have readers be more data literate or have them understand data in a way or explain to them data in a way that they can understand. I always wanted to be a math teacher. Oh, and really? I will someday be a math teacher. Oh, really? Uh, but when I was at the New York Times, I left about three years ago. Yeah. I, 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 thought of myself a little bit as someone still in math education. Lovely. And, uh, you know, when, when a scientific study claimed that there was a link between, between red meat and cancer, okay, what does link mean? Mm. That's a data term. That's the statistical term. Mm. What does that mean? And are they being uh, disingenuous with that characterization? Mm. Uh, when, when a company says a product is effective or 90% effective, what does that mean? Mm. Uh, when the National Football League, and we may talk about that in, in a moment, uh, when the National Football League said that there was no connection between concussions yes. in their players and later life cognitive problems, yeah. I was able, just because of my math background, to look at the data and look at the, the Bayesian probabilities mm. and whatnot, and that sounds more highfalutin than it truly is. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to exploring yeah, yeah. this. Just oh. a, a little, for the people watching here, you might hear the lovely bells in the background. We are here in London, in Westminster, and we just had the Queen visiting us next door, and to celebrate all of this, the bells will be ringing for the next three hours. So I thought, no, they they went off. They're ringing for you. Are they? That would be nice. I thought. Yes. This, yeah. Yes. I, I thought whenever someone who was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize gets to London, this is what they're doing. No, that's doing. what the AK-47s <laughs> are for. <laughs> Very good. So, you, what did you? What did you get nominated for? What was your piece of journalism? Well, I, well, I did uh, a four-year long investigation into the link between concussions in sports and later life problems mm -hmm. or, or the risks of head injuries in sports. We dealt with the military a little bit as well. And of course, worldwide, people's experience with it is more in soccer or, or rugby or whatnot. Uh, but it was 130 articles wow. over four years, and uh, it, we treated it as a public health story. It wasn't a professional football cover-up yeah. story, although there were aspects to that. But it was fun because I am a proud card-carrying math geek. I mean, I could pull, <laughs> pull, pull out my uh, membership card here, and uh, to to flex those muscles yeah. was was really a lot of a lot of fun nice. because. When, for example, the National Football League's lawyers would say things like, hey, there are a ton, the vast majority, I don't know if you know this, the vast majority of football players don't have dementia, don't have any problems at all. So why are you giving us such a hard time? Well, that's a probabilistic argument. That's a data-driven argument, but you don't make statements about health issues by saying how many people don't have the problem. I mean, that's like saying the vast, by the way, I don't know if it's, it's true, the vast majority of heavy smokers never get cancer. And it's that type of hogwash yeah. that I was very intolerant to and am in all sorts of contexts, articles that I would do on pharmaceuticals, mm. okay, or other sci scientific uh, things. I really enjoyed making sure that the public, if they're going to get the data, mm. the numbers are the numbers, but are they, am I going to explain them mm. in a way that is fair, accurate, and clarifying to other messages that they may be told by stakeholders who have a different agenda? Great. And now, nowadays, you 
you bring your wisdom of math and journalistic experience into the corporate world and you help yes. organizations um, translate data into messages, into insights. So tell me a little bit more about what you do Well, now. Uh, I guess before uh, with the football and with, uh, with pharma, I was, in, uh, I, was, I was in crisis causing now I'm in crisis management or crisis avoidance. No, the idea is to make sure that whatever data you've got, if you're communicating it in investor materials, in advertising, in media relations, in any sort of internal memos, white papers and whatnot, what data do you have? What does it mean? And how can you communicate it in plain English, which is my specialty? It's one thing to know what the data mean in a jargonistic or, or, or really data scientist sort of way, but what is it going to mean to the real people you're trying to connect with? If something is 19% more effective or likely, okay, how do we make that sing? How do we humanize that? How do we make sure it's correct? Heaven forbid. Uh, you know, it's, it's really, and, and one thing that's nice is my clients, in journalism, I dealt with a lot of bad guys. And these clients, they want to do the right thing. They actually want me to find their mistakes mm. so that they don't get in trouble with regulators or the media. And so I'm a bit of an insurance policy and I sort of play journalist to ferret out any issues that they have. But then also, it's all very good news because then what you've got is great. Mm. And then let's make those numbers sing using you know, English or writing or or whatever it may be. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a lot of fun and it's nice it's nice working with the good guys. Uh, it's yeah, it's no I, fun I, going up against the bad guys. I, I agree. I mean, when when I work with organizations, I always use this analogy of a good journalist. I always say, what you need to do is you need to work a bit like a good journalist. You need to investigate your data, your story. Then you need to translate this into a really good front page that has a headline that explains what this mm -hmm. means, has a good picture in terms of a good data visualization, and mm -hmm. then has a, a short narrative. What you and make, you take this a step further, make sure that yeah. this headline and narrative is actually right. Well, but they're not only correct, okay, but compelling. Yeah. You don't, Completely. I mean, the, most of the writing that you see regarding data is so dull. Mm. But these numbers have, you know, they're people. Either, either they represent people or there's a reason people care about these numbers. It's yeah. something visceral. And you want to draw upon that. Heaven forbid you have a little anecdote at the beginning. I mean, that's one of the things I do is I write executive biographies mm. for the C-suite folks. And they're not dull. And they put them on the web and they're actually interesting to read yeah. because I used to do that on the front page of the mm. paper. And... Uh, you know, it's a certain vanity mm. thing where they're like, well, you know, I wouldn't, I would love to have something that's actually interesting instead of, you know, Joe Smith has been on the board of many organizations over the years. You know, that's just dull. I made, I had one guy who was a convicted felon and uh, with bank fraud and he was in the banking industry. I mean, so it wasn't like he did something over here and whatever, no, I mean, this guy went to prison for bank fraud and I wrote the biography to help dramatize that, to help humanize it and be totally out in the open with it. People loved it. Interesting. Because it, it we literally, we actually, I shouldn't be, whatever, but I mean, we put the indictment as, as a hyperlink. <laughs> Because we made it interesting, we yeah. made it exciting, mm. rather than, you know, it just helped distract from mm. what would normally be of concern. But in terms of, in terms of the data and taking, and taking data, uh, for example, one of my clients is a group of, of folks who want to increase their pensions, get their pensions higher from their uh, employer. And I had to figure out, okay, what numbers can we generate from the past and talk about sort of increases that have been done? How can I take those and make something three times as much mm. seem 
more palatable than what's already been done. And so you figure out, okay, this is what I can say in terms of percentage. Or actually, you want to know a secret? There's a, I, should we tell them? Okay, we're going to tell them. The difference between average and typical, that word, okay? You tell me? Mm -hmm. Okay. It, no, they they mean, sound the same, right? Yeah, absolutely. They, they sound the same, but yeah. they're not. Because average, and you know, to the extent that we have some data literate folks watching, um, average, of course, is the mean. It's it's the whatever, and, and so whatever the distribution is, boom, that's your that's your average. But typical is more like the median, mm. okay? And so that's in a different part of if it's a bell curve or whatever the distribution mm. is. And so you see, politicians do this all absolutely. the time when when it comes to a tax cut, okay? The people doing the tax cut, if it's for rich people, which in the United States I'm pretty familiar with, not the rich people part, um, they will say that the average savings per taxpayer is $3,000, 3,000 pounds, whatever. But that that's because it's so skewed on this end, okay? Meanwhile, the Democrats in this case are going to say, no, 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 the typical savings is more like six hundred dollars because the vast majority of people are around the six hundred dollar mark and it's this language you know yeah. how you, you mean you can really leverage it and and to some extent this and brings don't me lie. To, to another area that i would like to talk about the fact that actually improving data literacy across the entire population is something that we want to do because yeah. What I see in the press and in politics is that they're almost weaponizing misinformation. They're using right. data to tell false stories. No, they're using words yes. to tell false stories. Absolutely. We have to look out. Yeah. For, it's not the numbers do not lie. Mm. Mark Twain was absolutely <laughs> wrong. The numbers don't lie. Words lie. And it's the words that we use to communicate those numbers. Uh, when we say significant increase, or say that something increased, mm. well, by how much, mm. and and is it meaningful? Okay, um, it, it, these words need clarification. Very and good. and the the point that you were making a second ago with uh, what I liked, what I did for ten years, not anymore, is I tried to increase the data literacy of of the citizenry. And let's face it, your employees, okay, are citizens first, Absolutely. and they will get more data literacy or the, through media, th through what they see on television, read in the newspaper, see on the web. Their data literacy is challenged every single day. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, my, my hope was to make it where people are more data literate in their lives and they can bring that into into the company. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your time, Alan. My pleasure. Thank you. You got it.